Take your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> I am not a PSL type of person. I do not like pumpkin spice latte. I'm just going to throw it out there. You can throw a pumpkin at me or hit me, whatever. I like the smell of pumpkin. I don't want to smell like a pumpkin. I don't like the taste of pumpkin. In fact, the only way I can eat pumpkin pie is I want a sliver about that small and completely smother it with whipped cream where there's no taste of pumpkin and then I can eat it. So uh, if you bring me a pumpkin pie, I'll share it with all the staff, but I probably won't eat a whole lot of it myself. But uh, I do like the, the smell of it, that we have some fall candles uh, and we're decorating for fall and uh, getting ready for, I love, this is one of my favorite times of the year. And I love to see the, the change of the seasons. One of the beautiful things about North Carolina, uh, if you are new to the South, new to uh, North Carolina, it doesn't stay, uh, you know, uh, as hot uh, as Hell's Front Porch. Uh, people talk about uh, for the entire year, uh, we have our season that's really, really hot. And you'll uh, uh, end up, uh, you know, suffering through. And if you uh, lost power over the last couple of days, I uh, hope that that has been restored, and uh, we are uh, uh, not making light of that in any way, shape, or form, but it does get better, and fall is a beautiful time of year. If you have a, a porch, it's a beautiful time to sit outside and eat outside and uh, have a chance to take in all of the, the sights of fall. You know, one of our um, opportunities as we've been talking about our, our branding, our new logo, is to ultimately see and reflect our church's mission and vision and everything that we do as a church. We want it to be something that every time you see the Calvary Rally logo, you say, oh, I see that triangle. I'm reminded that we are to declare the name of Jesus in the triangle in the world. I'm, I'm reminded that we're on the mission to lead and create disciples of Jesus. I'm reminded of why we celebrate the goodness of God and how we're to connect with the body for growth and how we contribute through serving, through giving, through going. We have a, a vital part of what God wants to do through his church. And next Sunday, uh, our, we were supposed to have group league today uh, with all of the people having, being without power. Uh, so many people, even in our church, lost power. How many lost power at some point during the storm? All right. All right, anybody still not have power at your house? All right, anybody still not have power? I was going to say, those are the ones that are sitting all by themselves. <laughs> I'm totally playing. But hey, if you need a shower, uh, let us know. Uh, we have showers here at the church uh, and uh, plenty of homes where you can take a, a shower and uh, get clean. Uh, please reach out to us. And anytime we have a storm like this, uh, reach out. If you need the help uh, at your house, we would love to help uh, if there's a need personally that we can meet as a church. Uh, during this time, our vision is declaring the name of Jesus in the triangle in the world. It's not something that we just want to talk about, but it's something that we seek to live out on a daily basis. It drives and motivates our planning, all of our procedures, everything we're doing as a church hinges on what our mission and our vision is talking about. Our mission is together we lead and create disciples of Jesus. That's why we exist. It's why the church has been here for 36 years. And last Sunday, we started looking at the three C's of our core values. And we're going to kind of recap those first two. But I want to dive into that last one today as we wrap up the series. Because it's so vital to understand the DNA of how God has uniquely equipped his church. What is our purpose when you're looking around seeing lights and video and, and sound and all of the new parking and, and, and all the things that are coming in, in the weeks and months ahead. It's not about building a name for ourselves. It's not so that people come by and they're super impressed with, wow, that church is huge or wow, that church is, you know, it, it's not about that. My name's not on the sign. And it's probably a good thing because maybe it would deter people from coming, who knows. But at the end of the day, it's not about building a brand. It's ultimately about pointing the world to Jesus Christ. It's about pointing our neighbors, our, our country, the nations to the Jesus who is the hope of the world. He is the only one that offers us a, 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 a 
forgiveness of sin, redemption. He offers us a new uh, relationship with God that's only possible through Jesus Christ, God's Son. And so I invite you to open the Word of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to jump in there in just a moment. But that first C is celebrate. We are created to be worshipers of Jesus. We're created to worship God. And uh, but we are, we're made by him and for him. That's our entire purpose for creation. So we desire to lead disciples of Jesus who are obedient in their personal worship and in their corporate worship gathering. And I realize you're at church this morning, so I'm preaching to the choir. Sometimes you're like, and you're preaching to the ones of us that are all here. We're, we're, we're plugged in. But what we want you to understand is if you're visiting, if you're just attending today, if you're seeking and, and searching for the right place, we are a church that desires to celebrate the goodness of God. We want to celebrate his word. We want to celebrate in prayer. We want to celebrate on our knees. We want to celebrate through exalting one another, equipping the saints, calling one another to holy living and righteous living. We're desiring to encourage the body of Christ. And it can only happen through corporate worship. We desire to make personal corporate worship a high priority in our lives. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. What is he saying? He said the vital part of corporate worship, of celebrating, of personal worship, is lifting up and exalting the name of Jesus and saying, God, I believe you are supreme. You are number one. You get first place in my life above everything else. And why do we worship on Sunday? Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. But folks, it's, I think it's important to carve out time in our schedule to say, God, I'm making it a priority to be faithful to the house of God week in and week. Do I always feel like going to church? Absolutely not. Anybody else feel that way? Do you always feel like going to church? No, there's some Sundays that I don't. There's some Sundays that I wake up and I'm telling you, it is cold outside. You know, it's, it's that feeling of, I'm just being real. Listen to me. I, the, the days that it's raining, I mean, it is pouring. You're like, boy, I could just roll over, <laughs> set an alarm for 10, 29 and a half. And, and tune in online, and I could watch Pastor David with the covers up to my neck or sitting there with a pumpkin spice latte. I mean, I could really enjoy worshiping Jesus on my porch. Uh, I could really enjoy worshiping Jesus at my kitchen table with a, a, a gravy biscuit, and a, I could enjoy it with a, a ham biscuit or whatever your, your go-to is or that nice hot cup of coffee, and, and you're thinking about, you know, I can get so much more done, or I can sleep a little bit longer, I can do all... Folks, the temptation is to not prioritize the things of God and say, you know what, I'm just, when I feel like it, I'll make it. When I, when I have time and there's nothing else going on, I'll go to church. But folks, it's so vital that we prioritize that beginning of the week, that starting off with God, that corporate worship that you can't get in any other setting, and that's... The beauty of living in the church age, the beauty of living after the resurrection of Jesus Christ is we get to worship God. We get to celebrate the goodness of God. And one of the huge benefits of gathering together for worship is we get to celebrate his goodness. We get to see all of these people joining the church, getting baptized. We just had a baptism Sunday uh, just a couple weeks ago. We got to celebrate all, actually, the last month, I think it's eight or nine that have been baptized. We have more, some that were out of town because of a death. Some more that just joined the church that are going to uh, get ready to uh, get baptized. Folks, it's exciting to see what God is doing through his church. I love when these kids come across the stage and the parents and we dedicate them. And folks, they don't get saved at that point. But it's a reminder that mom and dad are saying, I'm making a commitment in front of God and all of the witnesses of the church, I am going to seek to bring my children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I'm going to seek to teach them the good news of the gospel. And my prayer is that at an early age, they understand that Jesus loves them so much 
that he died on the cross for their sin. And we want to celebrate those things. We want to celebrate the salvations. We want to celebrate life change. We want to celebrate victories. We want to celebrate and we want to encourage one another when we're downtrodden, when we're weary, when we're worn out, when a storm has hit our yard and there's a tree across the driveway. We can celebrate with you by helping lift that tree and move it. When he was talking about, say to the mountains, get moved, you know? It, it's, it's exciting to see the church pray. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here staring right at Miss Winnie, but what an awesome picture of faith and prayer, answered prayer, where God healed you of cancer. I mean, and it's so awesome to experience that within a context of a local New Testament church. God is doing miraculous things. We get to celebrate with Pastor Fabio, the, the hundreds of kids that they're ministering to through uh, uh, Camp uh, um, Compassion International. We get to see what God is doing on other parts of the world. We don't have to, we get to. And it's the weekly gatherings that we're able to encourage one another to live holy and righteous lives before God. And we pray for one another. We come together to celebrate in corporate worship. We're stirring up one another to love and good works. That is difficult to do from your couch. Are there moments that we have to do that? Absolutely. But it should not take the place of gathering corporately as the body of Christ. Because folks, I think we've gotten so comfortable sitting on our couch that we've lost sight that the world is dying without Jesus. And, and folks, we're so caught up in our own selves. Well, Pastor David, I'm just sitting here by the fire. I'm just sitting here kind of taking it easy this weekend. It's just been a hard week. You know what happens when you get up and you go even when you don't feel like it? The blessing that you receive. And I'll be honest, some of the older saints in our church are some of the most faithful people week in and week out who go regardless. Why? Some of it is because it's in their DNA. They were brought up in the house of the Lord going to church every single week. And folks, there's something to be said about creating that discipline, about creating that habit as a church where every week we are prioritizing, celebrating the goodness of God. We're prioritizing for the child of God that weekly gathering for worship and celebration is vital to our health and the encouragement of the saints. Do we see secondly that connect, the second C is connect, and this is where you discover community. This is where you build relationships. People are moving here from all over the country, all around the world, and they're saying, I don't have any friends. I'm looking for friends. And they slip in as the service has already started, and they're gone before the last amen. And they have mastered the art of stealth church attendance. All right, we have stealth bombers that, you know, go under radar and no one knows that they're there. But we have some people like that in the church that have mastered the art of stealth a church attendance. And they literally slip under the radar and they're out the door before the pastor can even get out there. And they have literally, they have created a, a, a situation where it's ideal for the introvert. But it's not healthy. You say, well, Pastor, that's just not my, that's not my MO. That's not how I, that's not how I roll. I'm, I don't like crowds. I don't like people. But God says we are created to thrive within a community of believers where we need one another. We need to sharpen one another. We need an, a hug. We need, do you realize there are so many people across our church that are single and, and they need a hug this morning? Some of you young men are going, Phew. I can think of a few people I'd like to hug in this church. Not that kind of hug. We're not talking about, I'm just saying an encouragement. Come alongside of another guy and put your arm around him and say, hey, brother, how's it going this week? I'm praying for, uh, uh, reach out beside another lady and a young mom who's struggling and saying, I want you to know I prayed for you this week. Can I bring you dinner this week? Can I encourage you? Can I? And folks, what happens is it encourages us. When we would encourage other people, it encourages us because it gets our mind off of ourselves and our failures, our circumstances, our struggles, and we get to see other people in that need. The church is a community where discipleship happens and it connects as a family. We grow deeper. 
The real growth happens not in the rows that we're sitting in this morning. It happens in a living room. It happens around a, a kitchen table or a dining room table. It happens, we have groups that meet at seats over there in the little eating area, the food area. And if you go over there on a Wednesday night, you'll see a whole bunch of guys that just gather. And, and, and they're studying the word of God together. And they're growing in relationship with Jesus Christ. It happens all over the city. Folks, it's, what it's all about. We grow deeper through authentic relationships where we can dig into the word. Where it's okay to, I don't understand that. Can we, can we go back to verse 17 again? Can we go back to, I was struggling with that this week. I didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me. And it, or you can dig into the word of God and ask questions where we're challenged and encouraged. Where we pray together. We pray for one another. We offer intercessory prayer. We see God answer prayer. And we grow with other believers. Church, it's vital that we connect. And next Sunday... Uh, due to the, the weather and everybody losing power and stuff like that, we bumped our growth, grow, uh, growth link to next Sunday. And we're going to, right after the service, we'll have tables set up all the way around the worship center where you can go around and meet different small group leaders and see people in those groups and uh, get a connection of, of what there is going on and ways that you can plug in and, and grow in your faith. Galatians 6.10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. It's vital that we plug in. We owe it to ourselves and our walk with Christ, as well as the body of Christ, to plug in and grow in this way. And we're so much stronger together. But now we get to that third C of our core values, the word contribute. We are to help build his kingdom. I'm constantly talking about getting some skin in the game. And folks, there's nothing like plugging in and serving and giving and going in a church. Because what happens is, as long as we just sit there and, and fill up a seat on Sunday and we walk out the door and nothing is taking place in our lives, folks, we are just a spectator. And being a spectator is fun to some degree. There's something about cheering our house watching the, the hurricanes on my phone yesterday and I pulled out a win and I'm thinking to myself, this is awesome. I mean, jumping up and screaming and, and we love to cheer on our favorite sports team. But folks, we weren't created to be a spectator in the Christian church. We are created to be a vital living part of the body. We are the bride of Christ. He loved us so much that he died on the cross. He redeemed us. He saved us to serve to give it and to go. He gave it as a purpose. So after we're born into the family of God and salvation, the purpose of our life begins to take shape. We begin to understand that we weren't just created to work for 30 or 40 years, retire and buy a place in Boca Raton and, and just kind of chill for the rest of our lives. So they're like, man, you just like made fun of my whole life plan. I mean, I was gonna work 40 years and we were gonna move to the Keys we we're going to move to Palm Beach or wherever it is, and, and we we're going to buy a place at the beach, and we we're going to relax and just kind of chill and coast for the rest of our lives. You say, what's wrong with that? That's not the reason we were created, folks. We weren't created to live this life, to climb a corporate ladder, to amass a certain wealth or status here in this earth. And folks, that sounds so much like the American dream, and I'm not putting it down. It's not wrong to desire to have a, a nice home or, or, or have a picket fence with a, a Labrador retriever and 2.5 kids. That's not wrong. But folks, that shouldn't be the thing that motivates us and calls us to action. It ought to be a love, a passion, a drive to make disciples of Jesus and to fulfill the purpose, the calling, the vision of why Jesus has left us here on this earth. We must get plugged in. So serving, it's a privilege to serve the Lord after all that he's done for us. We don't have to. We get to. Can you say that with me? We don't have to. We get to. We don't have to. We get to serve the Lord. And what happens is the more we serve, the more excited we get to see the impact that the gospel is having on families and people and individuals all over our city. Folks, to see people come in and talk about 
churches that are being watched and planted in, in Brazil. And you're going to hear from uh, Dave Carroll here in a couple, two Sundays, October 16th, and talking about the church that our church helped found in, in uh, 2019, right before the pandemic started, Chapanatinga, Brazil. We had a chance to go and help be on the front end, the, the, the front row seat of launching that brand new church plant. Folks, I'll never forget the excitement on the people's faces as we gathered and prayed and invited and, and canvassed the whole area. And it was so exciting to see those people show up on that very first day and see life change, see the gospel begin to penetrate the dark world. And folks, serving is a privilege. It's a responsibility of every believer, not just those who serve on a church staff. One of the roles of the pastor uh, according to the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.12 says, is to equip the saints for the work of a ministry for building up the body of Christ. Think about it for just a moment. The pastor's role is not to do serve in every single capacity. There are some areas you probably don't want me serving. I mean, I get nervous, and I'm going to be just straight up honest. I get nervous in a room of, like, second graders. They make me nervous. I mean... I don't know what to say. I mean, I, I feel like when I get up in front of them, and I do it from time to time, but that's just not my, that's not where I fit best. And I get nervous because I'm like, are, I'm going to bring it on to a level that they can understand. Is it easy for them? Anybody else feel that way? But you put me in a room of teenagers, I mean, I can come up with ideas for days uh, of things to do. And I remember for years, Steve, you served with me in youth ministry, and we would have huge teen events and I would I mean sometimes you would have a situation where you know the power would go out and you had to think on the spot and you had to come up with ideas and we would pull out a bunch of sodas and uh, kids would drink them and have burping contests and he said I mean I don't know if that's bringing people to Jesus in that particular thing but it was just an activity that kept them occupied they had a great time and before long I'm launching into preaching the gospel we've been in cities in, in India and I remember going into one, you were there in Northeast India, and the power went out. We had projectors. We had everything to show, uh, to sing songs, to show the, the, the visuals of the Bible story, and the power went out. You improvise. That's when the Holy Spirit of God shows up. And folks, what happens is, is you begin to serve the Lord. The joy of the Lord gets all over you, folks. You start to understand, but I'm just telling you, you've got to serve where you're gifted, where God has given you a calling. He's given you a, a, a work of God in your life. And the pastor's role is not to do all of those different jobs, but it's rather to help equip the body so that it can function at its full potential. potential. Folks, in fact, when the staff does most of the work, it stunts the growth of the body. So sometimes people have this mindset, you're like, well, that's what we pay the pastor. That's why we have a worship pastor. So we don't have to do that. That's why we pay the youth pastor. He's just supposed to entertain all the kids. I mean, have big activities and lock-ins every once in a while. And, you know, entertain them and stand on your head and spin around and, and, and say, do jumping jacks and, and teach the gospel. And if, if he knew all that, I mean, you're hired. And, and we think if we hire someone to, to run, to keep the children occupied, we can have a service without interruption. And folks... That's not the reason that we hire staff. It's not so that they can do all the work, but folks, it's so that we can equip the saints to do the work that God has called us to do. When you take the next steps class, we seek to help you discover at least one or two areas where you can plug in and serve the local church. And each and every week, we have dozens of faithful volunteers. Even when I roll into the church parking lot, it's usually about 8.15 there are a number of cars already here, some since 7.30, getting lights turned on, getting the screens on, getting the sound on, getting everything EQ'd, getting everything ready, tuning up instruments, they're practicing, they're getting mic checks, and they're getting ready to start practicing, getting ready for the service that's going to happen within a couple of hours. And I love seeing the passion that people have serving in the parking lot. You know what it's like? It's, it's fun to stand out there with a the Mickey hand on, waving at people as they're coming down the road. But folks, what about on the Sundays it's pouring raining? <laughs> 
They still are out there. Then your more of your thing is, I've got a big umbrella. Can I help lead you into the church so you don't get soaked? Uh, can we help you find a closer parking spot to the worship center? Can we help you uh, find a visitor space or a, a handicapped space? And folks, those, it's a joy that comes from serving Jesus. Jesus, joy comes from loving and serving Jesus, others, yourself. See, what happens is so often we go through life and we wonder why we're not fulfilled. We wonder why we're not happy. You ever meet some of the most angry people claim to be Christians? They're always just a gripe. I mean, I'm telling you, they are mad about something. And if it's not one thing, it's ten others. You ever meet those kind of people? I'm like, please, for the love of Jesus, don't tell them you go to church here. If you're an angry soul, I knew a person that there was not a restaurant they ate at that there was not something wrong with their food. I got to where I didn't want to hang out with them anymore because I was always so, I would eat the wrong meal sometimes just not to have to send it back. Anybody else? I mean, I, I don't want that waiter to spit in my food. I don't want the, I don't, I've worked in fast food. I mean, I got my start right next door at Hardy's. I mean, I remember people coming up after you were closed and demanding you serve them. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I've been behind the counter back there. I wouldn't do that. Uh, but anyway, I'm not going to go any deeper than that. But at the end of the day, serving is a joy because what happens is God begins to change the focus. Jesus is number one. Other people are number two. And yourself gets in line third. It gives us an opportunity to prioritize what things are important. Well, as you discover ways to plug in the local church and serve, you'll find much joy in knowing that you're helping fulfill the mission and vision of the church. We also seek to partner with local ministries, help meet the needs in our city on an ongoing basis. One of the reasons that we partner with the Durham Rescue Mission is, is their passion for reaching people with the gospel. They provide food, vocational training, counseling, and more to 400 men women and children in the triangle. We've had Ernie and Gail Mills to our church many times. We've had their victory choir come and sing. And these are people that were addicted to drugs and alcohol and different vices and addictions that were had literally knocked them off their feet and caused them to be sleeping under bridges and old park benches. And God got a hold of their heart. And, and folks, they're not just offering a, a handout. They're offering a hand up to Jesus. They're offering a new way, a new relationship. Go on their website and read testimonials of lives that are radically transformed by the gospel. If you can lead people to faith in Jesus, he alone can help them overcome addiction and whatever struggles have called them, caused them to be homeless. The program at the mission offers a one-year victory program where they go through extensive counseling with trained, seasoned counselors who help them deal with their past so that they can face a bright tomorrow, a future that includes a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have people in our church whose families have been receiving, uh, on the receiving end of, of the mission, uh, uh, the Durham Rescue Mission, and they partner with local community colleges and, and they help people get vocational training and, and help them get jobs so that they can support themselves and their families one day. Today, the Durham Rescue Mission has room to provide, it's, if you've never been to their campus, you'll see, I mean, beautiful buildings that God has given them because of faithful churches like ours, faithful people like you who support them and help those who are less fortunate, those that are struggling. That's why we partner with ministries like With Love From Jesus. They provide food, clothing, prayer, and hope to over 3,000 people in the triangle every month. They're meeting needs of people that are struggling just to put food on their table or to, to buy clothes for their family or to provide furniture. So when you're getting ready to, you're having a yard sale and you say, you know what? I told my wife the other week, we were talking about having a yard sale. I was like, if we never have another yard sale, it'd be too soon. I said, I can't stand sitting out there. It's always, you know, they want to clean out the, the, the uh, garage in July or the attic in July. And I'm like, I'm not interested in that. Let's donate it to some place like that 
who are going to help get household items and clothes and things to people in need. And folks, you can volunteer there every single week. Uh, Monday, I think through Saturday, between 9 and 2, you can sign up and be a volunteer and help minister to those in need in, in the Triangle. And they're meeting a real need in our city as inflation has taken its toll on our community. They'll be In November, we're going to be doing a, a food drive to help bring food together to provide to them that they'll give out so that as people are gathering for Thanksgiving, people who are less fortunate can have food to put on their table to help feed their family this Thanksgiving. But we go on to not only serving, when we contribute, it's also through giving. Our generosity fuels the mission of God. Hang on for just a second. It requires each one of us to do our part in reaching our mission of leading and creating disciples of Jesus. God has called us to be generous in ways that expand his kingdom here in the triangle and around the world. We get to be conduits through which his generosity flows. We give because he first gave to us. And our giving shows that we trust God. Look at, at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, which is our text. It says, the point is this, Paul is writing, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap, what church? Sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap, what church? Bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves what type of giver, church? A cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, so that having all sufficiency in all things... At all times, you may abound in every good work. I love this reminder because Paul is reminding us, one, you can't outgive God. He's, he blesses us when we're faithful and fulfilling his mission and his calling. But when we truly begin to understand that God gives to us what he can give through us, it changes everything. Now, I want you to do something real quick. Lift both of your hands up like this in the air. All right, everybody lift up real quick. We're going to have a little stretch, seventh inning stretch, whatever we're going to call it today. But lift your hands up. Leave your hands open like that. God will give to you what he can give through you. As our hands are open, we're able to receive blessings from God. But what happens so often across the church is we clench our fist. Don't clench your fist for just a moment. We hold on. We've got that job. We've got that dream job. We've got, we've got into the college that we've always desired to go to. We've done all that, and God has given it to us. He's blessed us. What do we do? We, we hang on tight. Why? Well, things might get tough one day. We might go through a recession. You put your hands down. We hold on. When we've got teenagers to raise, we can't give to God now. We've got a mortgage to pay or we're not making as much as we used to. And we're, God gives to us what he can give through us. With open hands, not only can we receive blessings from God, but we can give blessings from God. We can be a part of a church who's on mission in making disciples, creating disciples of Jesus. And verse 8 says, the verse uh, reads, God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things, I love that next little phrase, why did Paul write that in there, at all times? In the middle of the storm, he remains in control. When it seems like there is no way, he's still on his throne. He's still sovereign. He's still holy. He still cares when inflation is crazy and gas prices get to 4 and $5 a gallon, folks. He's still in control. And he, what he was calling us to do is have open hands and hearts that can receive blessings from God. But, folks, we can also, in turn, give back to God what he has blessed us with. Everyone, as we open our hands to God... God is blessing in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. 
It's not prosperity theology. People say, well, you know what? I, I just, that's prosperity theology. No, that's God's word on the matter. When we're faithful in giving of what God has blessed us with, what, being good stewards, we get to experience all that God is doing in reaching the triangle and the world with the gospel. He will allow more grace to abound to us. Paul teaches us to give as, he, as we have decided in our heart. Giving is a matter of the heart. It really shows what we value. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20. Uh, Paul is right, or, or Jesus is speaking. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21 says, for where your treasure is, there will what? Your heart be also. The Bible talks a lot about giving. It talks a lot about money. It talks a lot about finances. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So giving is a heart matter. We should never give reluctantly or give under compulsion. It should be done with a cheerful heart because of all that Christ has done for us. Just think, we don't have to give, we get to. We don't have to, we get to. And from time to time, I hear people say, well, Pastor David, I'll tell you, I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. I quit going to such and such church around the, road, around the corner because all they ever did was preach on giving. You know what that says about you? Can we just be, have the 411? The person who complains about the church that's always preaching and teaching on giving is the person who does not give at Hello. <laughs> when someone tells me that, I'm like, that is the telltale sign of someone who does not give one dime. And folks, those are also the people that always complain about everything in the context of a local church. Well, I'm telling you, I ain't giving one dime over there. You weren't anyway. You weren't anyway. But what it does is, as the pastor is faithful in teaching and preaching, he has to talk about that, because otherwise the church is, is stagnant, it's stale, it's not reaching its city, it's not reaching its potential for the gospel. You'll never reach that mission and the vision that Jesus called us to. Folks, they're, they're hoping, people that are, are giving, they love it when the pastor preaches on giving. Why? Because they're hoping the rest of you start getting involved too. They're like, man, if more people would give, imagine what we could do in reaching Raleigh in the Triangle. Imagine what we, the teams we could send all over the world to reach people with the gospel. And folks, people, let me think of it one other, one other way. By the way, those same people have no problem paying top dollar for season tickets for basketball, football, hockey. They never complain about paying $25 to park at the PNC Arena. They never pay, complain. They're wearing the jerseys. They've got the hats. They've got all the gear. Never complain about paying $25, $30 a person to eat at the game. No, they're having a ball. But then they come to church and they say, all they ever do is preach on giving. Wait a minute, you just went to Disney. I guarantee you that trip costs thousands of dollars. And every year people will take their, their tithe money and go to, to Disney. And folks, my family's all about some Disney. I'm the one that got Disney hands for everybody in the parking lot. But the reality is, is it should not take away from the mission and vision that God has created his church. He's called us to contribute. He's called us to be on mission. And folks, we, we, we can apply the same principle of stewardship to all of life. Because the job that you have, God has given you that job so you can be on mission for Jesus Christ. So the job that you hate, that you complain about every single day, what if you just changed your attitude and said, Jesus first, others second, yourself, that's me, last. And I go in there and realize I'm on mission in this classroom, at this office building, at this sales place, and I'm there for a purpose to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Our jobs, our talents, our, our treasures, our bodies are God's to use for his glory. And then thirdly and lastly, we're to be going. 
We ought to be willing to go and share the good news of Jesus with the world. Mark 16, verse 15, he says, he said to them, go to all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. The word go is not a suggestion. It's a command. He's saying, as you are going, as you're going across the street, around the road, around the corner, as you're going to, to Durham or, or, or Chatham County or uh, Joko or wherever, as you're going to your various places, you make disciples of Jesus Christ. Not everyone can physically go. In fact, there are some trips that we take. I'm like, you need to be in really good physical condition. India is not a trip for, for people who uh, aren't able to get moving. I mean, I'm telling you, we don't, we don't sit around and watch grass grow and paint dry. We are going to be moving the entire time, so you better get moving. You better be, be active. You better get good rest and be able to get moving the next day and, and figure out what it's going to take. But folks, the reality is, is God has called us to go. Not everyone can physically go to the uttermost parts of the earth, but many of us can. And that's one of the beauties of being an American is having that U.S. passport and being able to travel and take the good news of Jesus around the world. There's something that takes place in your heart when you go, that can, but can't be done any other way. You see how big God's world is. You see how vast his church reach truly is. You see the diversity of the body of Christ. Folks, it's not just us here in Raleigh. We are so spoiled. We're so spoiled. Do you know how many people they could put in a building this size in India? <laughs> the fire marshal doesn't even go out there. <laughs> I mean, they would literally have thousands. There wouldn't be chairs. We'd be packed in like sardines. And I mean, worshiping. The first time I got in a conga line in a Baptist church in India, I'm telling you, we had revival. I mean, they were just a dancing. And the next thing you know, we were in a line, and they're like, just jump in anywhere. And I mean, I was sitting here going, our church could see us right now. I mean, it was fun. I mean, it was lit. I mean, they were they were going nuts, and people were getting saved, and the service didn't even start until 9 p.m. on a Friday night. You try that in the U.S. Well, Pastor, you know, our kids have to go to bed. Wait a minute. You were at the Canes game until 11 p.m. You did a travel team, and your kids were up. Well, pastor, it's just too expensive. It didn't stop you from buying a new car. It didn't stop you from buying a bigger house. It didn't stop you from... Isn't it crazy the, the excuses we make while we can't do th certain things? It's really about celebrating and prioritizing the things of God and saying... I'm going to make it a priority. I'm making it comical, but the reality is it's a serious nature. The reality is, is Christ has called us to go. And, and here in just a, a couple of months, you're going to have an opportunity to sign up and, and to go. And, well, you can do it here, actually. We can, we're going to have a packing party in just a few weeks, uh, packing shoeboxes with Operation Christmas Child. We had one in July, and many of you came out and... There are hundreds of boxes already packed, but we're going to do it all over again because we love it. We believe in it. We, we can't wait to uh, pray over those and help send them out. But then you can go to Charlotte with a whole group of volunteers from our church. In fact, I think tomorrow is the day we reserve the actual time slots. Uh, but it's this week sometime, and, but it'll be coming up here in just a few weeks. You can register and go down on a Friday, a Friday afternoon and evening. And Saturday and serve in Charlotte and you get to go to the distribution center you get to meet some of the coolest people in the world I mean Richard and Kathy have been doing this for years and they like it so much they don't go once they go twice all right they, they go with their old church and, and run a rapids and then they come here with with Calvary and they go there and, and what happens is you go and you're you're packing crates and, and, and getting them all set up on pallets and 
Did you know exactly this one's going to Zimbabwe? This one's going to Kenya. This one's going to uh, Brazil. And, and folks, it's, it's awesome to pray over them. You have people come out and give testimonies. That I received one of these boxes as a child and it opened my eyes to the gospel that Jesus loves me. And you can have an opportunity. You don't even have to go to Brazil, but you can help take the gospel to Brazil and, and sign up for the opportunity. Now, and two, next Sunday, I'll be preaching on missions. And then the following Sunday, on October 16th, we have Dave Carroll, one of our the most excited missionaries I've ever met. And uh, he's, he's way younger than me. And they planted uh, Cornelia Church uh, in Brazil, in Arca Verde, uh, Brazil. Our church got a, a chance to go there a couple years ago and, and minister alongside of them. And then they planted a new church in Tupanatinga, Brazil. And they have, already have their own building. They're so on fire for God, and we'll have a chance to, to see them firsthand. But folks, we're planning mission teams to Nicaragua for next summer in June that you can go and minister to children and, and, and see what God is doing, be a part of a, a new church plant that Pastor Omar and his church is launching, and, and be a part of Melissa's work there, what God is doing in Nicaragua Christian Academy, and serve alongside of Pastor Fabio and see what God is doing through Compassion International. We have a medical mission team we're starting to form right now that are going to go to uh, Romania and serve with Pastor Elijah and Claudia. And they serve uh, in gypsy villages in Romania. And I'm telling you, nothing is going to prepare you for what you're going to experience. I'm talking about exciting is not even the word that comes to mind. Uh, administering in one of those villages, one of those contexts. Maybe you're in the medical profession. Maybe you're not. We can still use you. And, and folks, what happens is people are already coming forward and say, hey, I want to be on that team. I want to serve on that team. I want to be a part of that team. In fact, someone just the other day uh, was telling me another person that they knew of and said, hey, they're wanting to go too. Can they get in on this? And I said, we have more people. We can reach more people. We can do more to accomplish the gospel. Get your passport. Begin praying about opportunities to serve and get ready so when the opportunity presents itself, your answer will be yes. Some of our people have, that have been on mission teams, they said, Pastor Dave, we kind of got voluntold. <laughs> we kind of got told we were going to go. Well, God's calling you. If you pray about it, let's just go ahead and say, if you pray about it, Steve, you're going to go. Because he wants you to. He's called us to. Kim, I remember so many of you, the very first time you got to chase Rick and, and, and Wendy. I mean, the first time you got to go on one of these trips, it transforms. Aaron, see? First time you go, it transforms your walk. It transforms your witness. See, what's the application, Pastor David? What are the action steps of our core values? Celebrate, connect, contribute. Let's decide today, let's decide today to make Sunday worship a weekly priority of our schedule. The priority to celebrate will take your personal worship to a new level. It will take your corporate worship to a level that you've never even dreamed. As we join together with the people of God for encouragement and growth. Decide today to make Sunday worship a priority. Determine it's on the calendar. We're going every week. We're going to make that a priority to be in the house of God and worship him. Secondly, determine to connect with a small group. To dig deeper in your relationship with Jesus and with God and encourage one another. You need it. Other people need it. They need you to engage so that you too can encourage others. See, what happens is sometimes we go because we need encouragement. Sometimes we go and don't even realize that God's using us to be encouragement. He's using you to be the one that smiles, reaches out and shakes someone's hand, puts your arm around their shoulder and welcome them or thank them for coming. Can I pray for you this week? Can I encourage you? Is there something that I can do to help you or come alongside of you and encourage you in your walk, your witness, 
in your walk will encourage others who need to step up. And then thirdly, decide now that when the opportunity arises, you will go. Whether it's Operation Christmas Child, whether it's Romania or Nicaragua, whether it's a disaster relief trip with Baptist on Mission, I'm telling you, the storm that's ravaged so much of Florida, it's going to be years of rebuilding. I said, I've always wanted to travel. Why not take advantage of an opportunity to go down and be a blessing to somebody that's faced a, a disaster? I promise you, as you say yes, God will equip, equip you with the resources. Some people are like, Pastor, my budget's too tight. I could never afford to fly to Romania. Really? We have multiple people in our church that have flown around the world many times, and some of them have not paid one dime out of their own personal pocket. But God provided exceeding abundantly. Above all that they could even think or imagine, and if God wants you to be on one of those teams, He will make a way. Well, there seems to be no way. He'll make a way. He'll equip you with the resources. He'll give you the right words. Sometimes that's through an interpreter. <laughs> uh, and the ability to handle anything that comes your way as you say yes. Church, together we thrive as we seek to follow the mission and vision that God has given the Calvary Valley Church. Let's create disciples of Jesus and declare his name in the triangle and around the world. Heavenly Father, would you speak to hearts this morning?